Hello, this is the video to the paper revisiting Tado's framework for linear programming faster exact solutions using approximate solvers, which is joint work with Daniel de Douche and Lars de Weg. The problem we are concerned about doesn't need any introduction. We look at linear programming where we are given a linear objective C and we aim to optimize this objective over linear constraints AX equals B and one that X is not negative. And this problem has been studied for a long time. Um, the first fast algorithm for the problem was the simplex method by Danzig in the 1940s. And then since the late 70s and early 80s, we have with ellipsoid method and interior point methods, weekly polynomial solvers for this problem. And since then, there's the open question whether there is a strongly polynomial algorithm for linear programs. And now what is the exact difference between a weekly and a strongly polynomial algorithm? In a weekly polynomial algorithm, the runtime is allowed to depend polynomially on M and N, which are the dimensions of the problem and the bit encoding of, of um, the instance L. And standard variants like the ellipsoid method and interior point method, as just mentioned, have weekly polynomial runtime. A strongly polynomial algorithm, on the other hand, is not allowed to depend on the bit complexity L, but only on the dimension of the problem M and N. Furthermore, it must remain in P space. Now, in recent years, we had big progress on fast weekly polynomial algorithms for linear programs. You see in the lower half in the box, uh, many of the results for several dis different instances, uh, depending on the sparsity of the matrix and the rank of the constraint matrix and both randomized and deterministic. And what these solutions give you is an epsilon approximate solutions. So if epsilon is part of the input, then they give you an approximately optimal solution and an approximately feasible solution where the runtime is depending on the inverse of epsilon uh, logarithmically. Now, for algorithms where you allow um, bit complexity dependence, such a solution for a small enough epsilon is enough to round it to an optimal solution. And that is why these solvers are weakly polynomial, but not strongly polynomial. We have for special classes of LP, strongly polynomial algorithms. Those include network flow problems and special classes of LP here in particular, max flow, mean cost, and feasibility of two variable pair inequality systems, as well as discounted Markov decision processes and the maximum generalized flow problem. What we are concerned about in this paper is an algorithm that is depending on the constraint matrix only. That is, our runtime is allowed to depend on A, but not on the right-hand side B or the objective C. This has been done in the 80s already by Eva Taurus for what she calls combinatorial LP, there, if your constraint matrix is integral and you have a bound on the subdeterminants of the constraint matrix called delta, then her algorithm solves in your programs in time that is polynomial in M and, and the logarithm of this delta. Other algorithms that only depend on the constraint matrix are the layers least squared interior point method by Vavasis and Ye, which solves polynomially many linear system solves polynomial up to the logarithm of, of a condition number chi bar, which we will see later in this talk. And another algorithm that only depends on the uh, constraint matrix would be scaling invariant layers least squared method. Uh, that is our result from this year, where we, we, use, where we reduce the runtime of the Vasuzi algorithm by a factor of n, and also replace the condition number by the best condition number achievable by rescaling of, of the columns of constraint matrix. Now, what does this condition number chi bar have for properties? Well, for one, it is in the bit complexity model bounded by two to the L, and therefore a log chi bar dependence already gives you an L dependence for an algorithm. Furthermore, it only depends on, on the subspace that is the kernel of your matrix, and it is, as Tunchle has shown, and P hard to approximate within even a factor of two to the poly rank um, of your matrix. Now, the question here is, can we solve LP exactly with these fast approximate solvers. So what you've just seen with, with Eva Tarosh um, algorithm and with Leslie Square and point method is that every step is computationally expensive. And furthermore, the weekly polynomial solvers, for them, it's not clear how you would extend them, uh, extend the framework for the Leslie Squared uh, method to them. So here it's unclear how you could achieve something similar there. So the idea could be, maybe is it possible to use a black box approach where you can just plug in 
one of these fast weekly polynomial solvers and obtain an exact solver with then still uh, good runtimes. And um, something like this exists already. We have Eva Tauda's framework for variable fixing that does the following. This is also what we what we saw quickly in the result where you have dependent logarithmic on the largest subdeterminant of the matrix. One of the tools that she uses is proximity. You use an exact solver to a slightly perturbed problem, which then yields a solution x star to this perturbed problem. And then proximity tells you that there is a solution to the original problem that is in Supremum's norm not far away. And by not far away, I mean polynomial in n in the subdeterminant and the size of your, of your perturbation. And that you can use to fix variables. How can you do that? If you have a large variable in your optimal perturbed solution, then you know that for you, the original problem, there's also an optimal solution that is not too far away. So the variable is as well positive for the original problem. And then by strong duality, you can set the dual variable of, variable of this to zero and recurse on a smaller problem where you essentially project out or forget about these variables. Now her framework heavily relies on the integrality of the constraint matrix. And what we do is we generalize that to real matrices as our first contribution. So we give a black box algorithm that can handle any weekly polynomial solver that implements some Oracle for real matrices A and get the dependence on log chi bar a condition number again that we will see in a minute, instead of the logarithm of the largest subdeterminant. Furthermore, for us, it suffices to use approximate solvers instead of exact solvers for a perturbed problem. And with that, if you want to use a deterministic algorithm, for example, one of Van and Brandt, we are able to solve LP in time m n to the omega log chi bar. Furthermore, we always give certification in case of infeasibility or in case that our condition number is larger than we expected it to be. So that means for feasibility that in case of primal or dual infeasibility, we return a Farker certificate of exactly that. And in case that the condition number is larger than we, than we guessed and recall that Tunche showed that it's hard to approximate this condition number. So we always reiterate with, with larger guesses of the condition number. In case that our guess is too low, then we certify that by a circuit, a concept that we will also see in a minute. Okay, now let us go to this chi bar. What is it exactly? So by definition, chi bar is the following quantity, some supremum over matrix norms. And essentially this gives you, yeah, it's bound on, on the norm of oblique projections. As you can see, um, the set of matrices over which we over which we um, take the supremum of is mapping to the image of A transposed, which is the orthogonal space of the kernel of A. So you can expect that it really depends only on the kernel of A. And this is kind of is, is important for, for the linear system solves and bounding the norms of, of, your, of your predictor steps in the, in the path following method. Now we give a maybe more intuitive interpretation of, of chi bar with a more combinatorial version of it. So forget about chi bar for a minute and look at the following. We define a circuit of our constraint matrix A as some minimal linearly dependent subset of columns. And those sets, yeah, we call the C, we call the set of circuits. And now we define the circuits imbalance measure of this matrix. That is for any circuit, look at the ratio between two elements in the circuit then we maximize it over all pairs of the circuit and over all circuits. And this gives us the circuit imbalance measure of A. In particular for a TU matrix, we have that this kappa is, is one. And we have shown this year that this kappa is up to poly n factors equal to chi bar. In particular, if you take the logarithm, then they are just a constant factor away of each other. Now, what you've seen here is that for integral matrices, that kappa is always at most delta. But on the other hand, it can be much smaller. Consider following an example. 
say our constraint matrix A is the incidence matrix of a complete graph, then delta is, then pick any, pick any triangle of this graph, and then the subdeterminant of this is either two or minus two, an absolute value it is two, and then pick n over three disjoint triangles, and you'll see that the subdeterminant is two to the n over three. On the other hand, kappa, your circuit's imbalance measure, is only two. Why is that the case? You have to think about what are the minimal linearly dependent set of edges. Those are for one cycles of even length, where you set the values alternatingly one and minus one. And the other minimal dependent subsets would be two cycles of odd length that are joined by a path. And then if you appropriately set the values to one minus one, two and minus two on these edges, then you'll see that those are minimal dependent subsets as well. In particular, kappa is equal to two. So we get a, an exponential gap between the two, two quantities. And even in runtime for Tarot versus our algorithm, if you take the logarithm of it, you still get a factor n difference between the two. Now, what tools are we using to, to achieve this improvement? As Tarot, we rely heavily on proximity theorems for this circuit in the measure kappa. And for that, we first change a bit the perspective on linear programs. Now this, we had the standard formulation um, in terms of matrices, but another standard formulation that is equivalent would be that if we identify with the kernel of our constraint matrix A, the subspace W, then you'll see in the lower half, the formulation in terms of um, subspaces. And now we have a central theorem that is a proximity theorem as follows. Assume that the primal system X is in W plus D, X is now negative is feasible. So we forget about optimality for a minute. And then the proximity tells you that there exists as well a feasible solution that is at most a factor of kappa times the negativity of D away from D. So if D is now negative already, then well, you'd pick X to be D, then left-hand side and right-hand side are zero. And equally, you can think of that X minus D has a lower bound that is exactly the norm of D minus because every feasible solution has of course to fix the negativity of D which gives you exactly the, the one norm of, of D minus or let's, let's say the supremum norm of D minus. And the proof sketch would look as follows. Let's look at on the right hand side on the picture we have depicted an orange X and which is a feasible solution and in blue D, which has three negative components. And if you look at the vector X minus D, then this vector is in our subspace W. And now we decompose this vector into sign consistent circuits, which exists by Caradeodori theorem. What do we mean by sign consistent? By sign consistent, we mean that whenever a component of X minus D is positive, then, what, then the circuit has an, on this component, not a negative value, and exactly the other way around, if X minus D has a negative value on a, on a variable, then the circuit is not having a positive value on, this uh, value on this variable. Okay, now we are going to ignore all these circuits that do not intersect the support of D minus. So that doesn't intersect a negative coordinate of D. Why can we ignore them? Because applying them to, to, to D will not help us in fixing the negativity of D. And now for all the remaining circuits, we have, thanks to our kappa bound on W, that the, that the variables outside of D minus change only by a factor of kappa times the variables in, in D minus, which then gives you exact the bound that the theorem um, asserts. How can you use that theorem um, for an implementation of a feasibility algorithm. We, ex we exploit the theorem as follows. Now let's look at this instance here. And let's say um, on the right-hand side, we now see a couple of iterations. Okay, we have small negativity. Okay, now we have small negativity um, on the upper bar and the lower and the upper graph and the lower graph tells us that that now there is also a feasible solution 
that is closed. So this orange is essentially the, the uncertainty a guaranteed proximity that the proximity results gives us. And the idea in the recursive algorithm is now as follows. Find a near feasible solution with your approximate solver and look at the large coordinates, which we now call I. And for those coordinates, we know that there is a feasible solution to the primal system, which is still positive on these coordinates. And therefore, we are projecting out these variables and just focus on the relatively small variables in J. And the idea is now that every feasible solution that we find in on the variables in J can be completed to a feasible solution on the full set of variables by proximity theory. So this is the, the idea. Um, the question that you have to answer is how can we guarantee that i is not a negative so that actually we are making progress? And also, to, of course, the question, um, how are we able to produce a solution on the full space once we found a solution on, on the subset of variables that is j? The central to, to that is, is the lifting operation that does the following. I give you a subset of variables j, and I give you a fixed values on, on these variables. And now I want you to find the minimum norm vector in my full space W such that the coordinates on J are exactly how, how I gave them to you as an input. And now this can be computed as a projection matrix. And what you can show is that the norm of the lift is bounded by kappa times the norm on the fixed variables in J. Proof would again similarly be the circuit decomposition argument and now this is exactly central to lifting up a feasible solution on the variables J to a feasible solution on the full on the full space, even including the variables in I. And now this gives rise to, to the feasibility algorithm. What we need is an oracle that gives us a near feasible solution that is also proximal to our input vector D. And approximately we mean proportional to the negativity of D. The existence of such a solution is given by the, by the feasibility, um, by the proximity um, theorem. And we need a higher const constant to actually implement that. And the feasibility algorithm then gives you on this lower, in the smaller set of variables, a feasible vector that is proximal to your input vector. We lose a factor of kappa, which is only required um, because this allows us to compute things faster um, again, proximity theory would give you the right-hand side without kappa squared, but only with kappa, but um, for fast computation, we, we need this factor. And we, now we do exactly what we, what we suggested on the previous slide. We use the oracle to our full set of variables to find a near feasible solution and near proximal to the input vector. Then we look at the large variables and forget about them and focus on the small ones and solve the problem exactly on the small ones. And because the solution that the feasibility algorithm gives us on the, on the smaller set, we are able to lift this up of the lifting operation back to the full set of variables at, while maintaining non-negativity. This is the idea. A um, bit of a runtime analysis is that as we described that we had needed most n recursive calls and with a bit more care and thinking about the dimension of the dual space that we're considering, this recursive argument can be reduced to M calls. And this in total gives us a feasibility algorithm using, for example, the algorithm by Van den Brand, because we use it because it's deterministic, uh, gives us a runtime of M n to the omega times lock um, the condition number. Okay. And regarding the, the guesses of the um, regarding the guesses of the kappa is we maintain a guess m of it. If we realize that our guess is too small, then we then we square every time and repeated squaring um, still maintains us the, the claimed runtime bound. Okay. How can this result be extended to optimization? And the idea is, well, we can, we can have such a proximity theorem for optimizing, optimization as well. 
And that is as follows. Again, we have here the primal and the dual system. And say we are given a feasible dual solution, S, that is not necessarily optimal. We only need feasibility. That is non-negativity, and it's in the right affine subspace, W perp plus C. OK. Now the theorem is that if the primal is feasible, then there exists an optimal primal solution such that it's um, such that it's delta to D is at most kappa times, again, the term that we knew from feasibility, the negativity of D and D on the support of our dual solution S. And this proximity theorem again gives rise to, to, to an algorithm, namely what we do now is we need, instead of N, we need N times M calls to a black box solver um, and we split our algorithm into an outer and an inner loop. And in each hour loop, we will find a primal dual solution that allows us to apply this proximity theorem. Namely, we create a primal solution that is not feasible, but the dual solution is feasible. And the primal solution fulfills that it's near feasible and its norm on the support of the dual solution is small. And therefore, we are again able by the proximity theorem to learn about positive primal variables in an optimal solution, and therefore recursing on the variables that are small. Now, this gives a total runtime of um, the same as the feasibility times n. So, in total, as we've seen um, on the overview view slide of O of m n to the omega plus one times log logarithm of the condition number. Let me conclude with a few open questions. One of them would be the asymmetry between primal and dual feasibility. Recall that we only need M Oracle calls for primal feasibility, which also means that we need N minus M for dual feasibility. Is there maybe an algorithm that would achieve the minimum of both for both primal and dual feasibility? Another open question regards the outer loops for optimization. So in the outer loop, we learn that for optimization, some primary variables must be positive in an optimal solution. But then when we recurse on the smaller system, we kind of throw away all the progress and everything we've learned about um, the relations between primal and dual variables on those um, in the previous outer loop and essentially start from scratch. So maybe is it possible to amortize here runtimes and get something something less than than, than these um, MN Oracle calls. Another interesting question would be how to extend the approach with proximity to different systems where we don't want to rely on kappa anymore. For example, for generalized flows, there are proximity theorems that do not rely on the circuit imbalance measure, but more on on graph properties. So, is it maybe possible to to kind of get an get an uh, overall theory for, for these kind of systems. And a very natural extension would be to generalize this Kappa theory for more general convex programs where still all feasible solutions lie in some um, subspace, in some linear subspace. Um, so yeah, here a question would be, can it ex be extended to maybe um, convex quadratic programs or, or semi-definite programs? Thank you.